We want to welcome you to Face to Face. I'm Evangelist Nathan Morris. You know, throughout this series, we have just had the privilege and honor to have incredible men and women of God that God is using in this hour to speak to a generation. Today is no different. What makes it more special is this man of God is a dear, dear friend of myself, my wife, Rachel, and the whole team. Dr. David Remedios, we welcome you to Face to Face. What an honor. You know, you're a pastor of Trinity Christian Center in Louisiana. You're also a doctor. God is using you in such a special way and you're so precious, not only to this ministry, but to all of my team. We love you. Thank you for being here today. My pleasure. You know, could you share with us a little bit of your background, how God kind of brought you to this place where you are today as a pastor, but also as a doctor and just being used mightily by the Lord? Well, the Lord, I put a call in my life even when I was a child and I did not know what that was gonna look like. There was also a desire to be a doctor and I, I never, never saw how they would come together. But long story short, what I, I felt the Lord leading me to the medical career. So I embraced it, I did it. And then all of a sudden, as I was very busy being a very busy surgeon, the call of God came. But in my brain, I thought I had to be one or the other. So I had to leave one, but, and so conventional wisdom says you got to be the one or the other, but God says, I've created you to do both. Some people think I'm extraordinary, but I'm actually very normal for what he created me to be. Because we tend to compare each other to each other, but we need to compare ourselves to what God created us to do, to what our assignment is. So I'm very normal. People get awed by what, when I tell them, but I'm just a regular guy doing what I was created to do. So I'm really happy. I feel very complete. And you know, outside. Dr. Remedios, I find you, your humility, that's what really speaks to my heart when I, I hear you, when I'm around you, that your heart for God is very rare. I, I, I love what God is doing in your life. I've had the privilege of speaking at the Louisiana outpouring. God used you to really birth this movement in Louisiana where people come from all over to this, just this, gathering of men and women hungry for God. Just share very quickly. I know there's a lot we want to speak today, but get very quickly, just share what God is doing in the Louisiana outpouring. Louisiana outpouring began about 19 years ago, powerfully touched by God when I went to uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina. The fire of God got on me. I had all this fire, didn't know what to do with it. And I just called a few pastor friends, come, let's just get together. And we invited Sergio Scataglini and that's how that was birthed. 19 years later, is waves of the glory of God. The real purpose of it is to empower and equip the body of Christ, pastor, leaders, because of the move of God that is coming to this nation wow. and around the nations of the world. So it's an equipping center. It's not about the outpouring itself. It's about what God is doing and is gonna be doing in his people and his, in his body. So that's I what I love about the Louisiana outpouring. It's it has the mind of the kingdom. It's not about one church or one ministry, it's the kingdom. And you know, Jesus spoke continually throughout the gospels about the power of the kingdom. And yet the kingdom is everything different to our natural mindset, to the systems of this world. You know, Jesus stands in Matthew chapter five and he begins to speak about on the Sermon on the Mount, the principles of the kingdom. He said things like, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. He also begins then to speak about blessed are those who mourn. Share with me, you know, I know today there's something on your heart that you really want to speak to those that are watching this. And I believe there's a word for someone right now. Well, mourning is something that all of us have to face. And uh, mourning is a necessary process. And I did, I always read over that part of the scripture and I would pass through it because I unconsciously didn't want to, we associate mourning with pain. Yeah. But mourning can only happen when you have truly loved, when there has been true relationship and there is a break of some type, either through death or perhaps separation or whatever goes on we mourn. The only way to mourn is to have truly love. And so God is a God of love. And so he gives us his love and we cannot, if we shielded ourselves in the process of mourning, we would have to shield ourselves in the process of love. And love is the essence of life. 
Love is, it's really what it is all about. God is love. God is love. So he's given us a spirit that dwells within us. And uh, I, I tried to avoid that until I began to get an understanding of what mourning is really all about. And uh, we tend to look at mourning as a bottomless pit from which we could never arise. We look at it as a depression and we look at all the pain. When Jesus is saying, I want you to make yourself vulnerable to love. And when it doesn't work out or separation happens or a break happens, there's going to be mourning because that's a response and that's a sign of the level of relationship. As a matter of fact, the level of mourning is directly proportional to the level of love and of relationship that there was. So when you, people want to avoid mourning, but then if they do, they really cannot truly love. You can mourn maybe for a leader of a nation, a nation can mourn, but they never had a personal relationship with that leader. But this family can tr really truly mourns. And there are certain stages. And Jesus said, you are blessed when you mourn. How could that be? Because he says, you will be comforted, meaning, that mourning is not an event, it's a process that has a final end that will end in comfort, that will prepare you to love even more intensely again and not to avoid. Some people, when they mourn after they've been through a process of mourning, they build walls, but then they, they can't love. They, they're not vulnerable. Jesus wants us to be vulnerable. I have a word for someone. Yet you have been avoiding mourning, and the Lord says to you, if you will embrace the mourning, you will be comforted. You will get to the other side and you're gonna to learn to love again more intensely. The past is the past, but God has a new season for your life. He's got a future, he's got a hope. He is embracing you. The comforter is coming to bring healing and strength. You're gonna end up much better than you were before. So that's what I sense in my heart. You know, th th there are certain things that we, in the natural, we want to avoid, but there is, true beauty and true treasure in the Holy Spirit when we have to go through times of seasons, you know. The, the scripture tells us, doesn't it, there's a time to weep, there's a time to mourn, but there's also a time to dance, there's a time to sow, there's a time to reap. What have you found, I know you told me a personal story of what you went through and what have you found, the, the true revelation of the Holy Spirit, the comforter, in a season when in the natural it feels like there's such pain but at the same time, God is revealing himself in a place that is, is uh, something that we would never want to ever endure. Oh, absolutely. I'm a war veteran, first Gulf War veteran. So that time came and I was in the United States Air Force and we were called, I was deployed to the Middle East and my wife and my two children and the reality hit us. It was a reality check at that point. And, and so I was going to a place of war and I, there was a chance that I would, may not return. I would never see them again. So that separation was amazing. So I got to the theater in the Middle East and because I was one of the leaders in my hospital, air transportable hospital, I took the reins and I began to lead. But I put all my emotions, I bottled them up, I put them aside because I had to lead. Uh, without giving myself permission to process and uh, some of the grief from my family. So I, I just bottled all that up. I led, I did a lot of things, took care of business. But interestingly enough, you, can, you, don't really, you cannot really avoid mourning. You can postpone it. So you either accept it and go through it with faith that the comfort is there to comfort you or you can put it off and then you're going to pay much more later. When I got back home, when the dust settled, uh, I went through the process of grief, but it was much more intense. Uh, it's probably part of PTSD, what they call it. I didn't know what it was back then. And it was for the same amount of time that I was gone, which was seven months, that's the same amount of time I went through that process. Wow, that's powerful. So I learned some things that Jesus said, if you will, you're blessed when you mourn. In other words, you have to trust Jesus. He is the comforter, plus he sent us the comforter. He knows we're gonna mourn. Jesus, for example, Jesus wept for Lazarus. He mourned for him. Yeah. He mourned for him because there was a, a level of closeness of relationship. Jesus, Jesus' favorite house was in Beth, Bethany with Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, and that was a place he would hang out because there was that close of a relationship when Lazarus was dead. He wept, but he knew he was gonna, 
and raise them up. He, he didn't say, oh, I know what I'm going to do, therefore, no. He gave himself the permission to embrace the emotion and he wept. The Bible says, weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice, so, you know. And you know, I think part of the revelation of that scripture is that Jesus is weeping, not just for Lazarus, but for those that were around Lazarus that didn't understand who was standing in their midst, that they didn't have the faith to realize that Christ was about to do something powerful. Just speak very quickly to those right now that believe that there's such a, it, it feels like such a darkness that there is light when we lean in Christ, when we just submit everything to Him. Yeah, that's the thing. None of us wants to be vulnerable, not even with God, even though God can do everything. And so you have to trust Him. When you cannot track God, you have to trust Him. You may not be, you may not know, you think this morning is a bottomless pit of despair, but Jesus said, you're blessed, I'm gonna bless you, I'm gonna comfort you, wow. you're gonna come out stronger on the other side. That's the thing about mourning. Mourning has a purpose. It's a necessary purpose and process in our lives. And we're gonna be more complete, we're gonna be stronger, we're gonna love with more intensity, and we need to embrace life because Jesus did when he, when he lived here among us. Praise and God. you're right, he weeps for those who are lost. He still weeps. Will we, when we share the gospel, some are gonna reject it. Mm -hmm. And so there's gonna be that uh, a process of mourning of personal rejection. But then there are those who accept it. And even when you planted the seed of the gospel and some of those who apparently rejected you, there's a seed there that may sprout later on. Amen. So there's always hope. There is always healing. There is always Do not be afraid of embracing life. Embrace the process. Trust Jesus. That's why he said, Bless, blessed are those who mourn. Are you mourning? Have you stopped mourning? Some of the process, some of the stages of mourning have been described in the literature. Some of it being, you know, denial, anger, uh, bargaining. And then the last one is acceptance. And, uh, it, it just it tells you that we go through those stages, but as we go through them, you're gonna go through it. As a matter of fact, God, more, God doesn't save us from things. More often than not, He saves us through things. Amen. The oh. Hebrew children, Shadrach, Mesach, and Abednego, He didn't save them from the fiery furnace, He saved them through the fiery furnace. Oh. Morning is the same thing, it's a fiery furnace. Wow. But what happened to Shadrach, Mesach, and Abednego? They were walking in the open flames with the Son of God. In, the midst. in your in your mourning, in the, that pit of despair, there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. There is a friend Amen. that will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Amen. There is a, the brokenhearted. When you're broke, God is close to the brokenhearted. Amen. There is a level of, of, of intimacy with God during our brokenness that could never be experienced in the types of joy. So God uses our brokenness to draw even closer to embrace us. Just like I comfort, used to comfort my babies or, and now my grandchildren, I comfort them, I bring them even closer to my heart. God does the same thing with us. Amen. He draws us closer and it's that intimacy that brokenness may bring, the mourning may bring, but that the intimacy does not compare so whatever it is that you're going through, embrace it because Jesus is there. He's promised to bless you. He's promised to comfort you, to strengthen you and build you up. Amen. Hebrew says we have this hope as an anchor for the soul. We'll see you next time on Face to Face. God bless you in Jesus' mighty name. We want to thank you for watching. If you want to know more about Shake the Nations Ministries and our YouTube channel, why don't you click the subscribe button? Also, if you want notifications of our brand new videos, why don't you click the bell? There's so much more in Shake the Nations Ministries that you can get involved in. Why don't you click also the link to our website to find out more? To find out more about our humanitarian arm, Hope of All Nations, make sure you click the Hope of All Nations button where you can learn about us taking the gospel to thousands of children around the world and our work in the ground of the nation of Honduras. We can't wait to see you next time.